I mean, what's Pro Football Focus doing? Last week they had Brady. This week they got Brady. We're doing it. We're literally doing it differently from everybody else. As a matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to PFL. All right, guys. Got George Shahuri here. Got Mike Renner over here. You have your own podcast. You have your own podcast. I have no podcast. <laughs> and the three of us are sitting here. Why the hell are we sitting here? Well, uh, we got to stay safe. We had a uh, little exposure with um, with our buddies, Steve and Sam. So they're at home protecting themselves. A reminder to be careful when you're out there. Don't do anything uh, stupid. But it was an opportunity. You're about to go on the road for however many weeks. We had to get you in here and get your uh, get your takes. The NFL podcast, Mike. I hope you're up to speed here on on everything. You've got your uh, you've already got the draft guide out for next year's mm-hmm. draft. Yeah. What the first hundred players, something like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean that's going to be the Big Ten and Pac-12s. Like they're finalized. Those are, <laughs> they're playing, so. that we're done. Yeah, but yeah, that's already out. But now I'm looking forward to this weekend's games are going to be. It gives you it gives you more time to work life. on NFL stuff. Yeah. If if you have never seen Mike's draft guides, twelve hundred pages, it was incredible. I mean, Fred Gadelli, who ran the draft for ESPN, is our producer now. He said, "I have never, in the history of anything we ever did with the draft, seen anything like it." So, you're up to hundred. You only have like another eleven hundred pages. It's good. <laughs> All right, we're gonna do speed dial, right? My only problem with podcasts in general is I'm like, you only have okay, one. Okay, well, yeah, I, mean, I have problems with everything. It's like, okay, man, I only have a half an hour, I only have an hour. Let's get through as many things as we can get through, right? And so, so uh, not like Sam is. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna try it this way. We'll find out. Maybe they'll put it down the sidebar, you know, a little PTI kind of style. So we'll, we'll do a couple of things. All right. Uh, first off, I'll do my own uh, little hot take. Uh, COVID, right? It's already impacted us and all likelihood. Congratulations, the NFL players, just to getting us to opening day. There's a chance that at some point, some team has a problem. And my take on this thing is that if you can't get there, if you your team can't get there for whatever reason, and we're playing every week and this is going to be tough, do they delay games, do they put it off the end of the season – and my opinion would be no, that COVID is now part of the National Football League. And it's up to you as a team to keep guys off the street and to keep them safe. Now, obviously, you can't protect everybody everywhere all the time. But when you go out to a bar, there should be fans of the New York Giants out there going, get your ass back in your, in your house. You've got to stay healthy for the football season. It, the best chance – for this thing to make it as far through with as many players as we possibly can is to, if you can't make it, that's an L. I, it's how valuable is your job? And is there, I mean, for NFL players, this is about as valuable a job as you can have. So it's not impossible. It's really not that hard to take some simple precautions. It really isn't. And if they just do that, I, we can make it through. We can, but the the fear of making one small error and screwing it up for everybody, I don't know. It would get me motivated to be smart. I'm curious to see what they're going to do with. I mean, say a team does have 15 cases, all of a sudden, like you get a minor outbreak. You're getting a tryout. That that, that I, I, hopefully, <laughs> let's see. But I I I do think that the way the MLB is doing it in terms of postponing these games, that's not going to work mm-hmm. in football. You can't postpone totally agree. games. Like totally agree. It's either going to have to be forfeits or they just play through it because that's just the idea of trying to play games later in the season is just impossible in the NFL. And I think if it's your team that had the outbreak, that's on you. Like you should be the one paying the price of that as a franchise. All right. Semi agreement here. All right, let's go on to Sean Watson. Just got paid just south of what Patrick Mahomes got right in that $40 million uh, range there. And obviously a great press conference. He comes on, they bring, you know, Dabo, they bring yeah, on his high school coach. Everybody's family. crying. His whole family it was fantastic. Um, but here's my question. We have yet to see the highest of the paid quarterbacks in the NFL win a championship. You know, uh, we, 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 well, obviously Patrick got paid, but he won it before. Uh, Russell Wilson, Aaron Rodgers, you know, some of these great players that are on the high end of the salary scale – 
are we taking too much off the top end for the team to have a chance to win? Tom Brady forever during the course of his career uh, would always take a little bit less. Patrick Mahomes, I would argue, took a lot less than probably what he could have gotten. But are we going to see these teams at the top end be able to win world championships, or is it going to constantly be you know, Lamar Jackson's and the Jared Goff's and the, the different guys that on their rookie contract end up going to the Super Bowl? I, I think that's overblown. I think it's a small sample size in the fact that, you know, Tom Brady's won, what, three in the last decade? Mm -hmm. Like, you're just working with, like, the sort of quarterback boom happens after Flacco in 2012, got that massive contract, and then everyone who basically signed after him had to get more because they were all better than Flacco. So there was that boom of the quarterbacks, and ever since then, there's only been, what, seven Super Bowls since then. So it, it's going to be a small sample size. I think that gets overblown. The teams like the Seahawks, they fell off because they started drafting like shit. Like mm -hmm. the Packers fell off because they let all their secondary walk after 2014. Like there's reasons why these teams who did pay these guys fell off, and, and I don't think it's because of the way they've managed the cap with the, paying their quarterback a lot of money. They still, those guys were still underpaid compared to the value they were bringing to the table with those big deals. You mentioned the other players. What does a great quarterback do for the rest of those players? Because the theory is if you pay the quarterback all this money, I can't have a good supporting cast around him. And that just doesn't bear out to be true. Russell Wilson, who you just mentioned, his offense as a whole was one of the best in terms of wins above replacement per dollar spent on the offensive side of the ball. And that's because he's freaking awesome. All right, let me, let me throw one theory at yeah. that. Okay, if you have a quarterback like Watson, if you have a quarterback like Russell Wilson, even Aaron Rodgers, you know, Lamar Jackson, guys that can move around, you can basically skip paying that offensive line, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Russell Wilson mm -hmm. for years, that's been the Seahawks. Now, obviously, the Texans have gone out of their way to be able to do that. But Laramie Tunzel comes over last year. And he gives up two sacks were, were the damnedest sacks I've ever seen in my life. He must have blocked this guy for six seconds. And then he finally just relaxed. He was like, oh, surely the ball is gone by now. And Watson's still running around with the thing. He ends up giving up a sack. And yeah. so his, <laughs> his numbers are going to get skewed. So do these guys now have to protect themselves? Peyton Manning used to protect himself by getting rid of it. Is it up to the quarterback to protect themselves now? The numbers would bear that out that quarterbacks own their pressure rate to a large degree. And that would be my question with Watson, which is, is he a top five guy? Because if he is, then you pay him. And I think you look at, you're comparing him to Mahomes, for example. The question is, for Watson, he has these games where that Baltimore game last season, where he's holding on to the ball forever, he takes seven, eight sacks, and you cannot win football games like that. So will he be able to move past that is that allow him does that allow him to be a top five quarterback because if so then paying him is the right move where you get into trouble is when you pay Derek Carr when you pay the guy that you hope is a top five guy but he's a top 15 to 20 guy that's where you're screwed because that guy can't make up for as you said a, a subpar offensive line a couple of receivers that aren't great so as long as you have a guy that's top seven you pay him everything yeah I think that's the biggest takeaway it's not that like the guys who are at the very top, the elite quarterbacks in the NFL are worth it. The guys who are in the mid tier, the mid tier has grown exponentially over the past decade or so. Like the influx of quarterback talent has been huge. Mm -hmm. At the same point in like 2011, there was probably about 15 competent quarterbacks that you could you know, feel good about starting the NFL. Now there's about 25. Now there's guys on the bench and Jameis Winston, Andy Dalton, who have been competent quarterbacks in Nick recent Foles. years. Yeah, like that, that you can find those guys on the streets well, now to some new. degree. So. I do think that if you're paying, like you said, a guy like Derek Carr, a guy like Kirk Cousins, $30 million a year, you can get similar returns for you know, $20 million But But less. you're going to be playing against Trevor Lawrence next year mm -hmm. for yeah. four or five years on a rookie contract, right? And that's, it's going to be tough to beat. That, uh, so. That's why if you're – so the Rams are interesting because you look at the Rams and you go, okay, I'm paying Jared Goff a little early. And now you look at it a couple years later and it's like – Man, I would really early. like a shot at Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields. Yeah. You can't put yourself in that limbo. Let me ask you this. Deshaun Watson, is he a top five guy this year? I, you know, I went back because what the hell else was I going to do and watch <laughs> like every throw, right? So his top five or six plays are among the most spectacular plays I've ever seen. 
I mean, I, I'm just, there's only one guy I compare him to, and that's Aaron Donald. Hmm. Like, Aaron Donald I watch, and I go, how does he do that? I mean, there's three guys, and he's wiggled his way and thrown one guy and be able to do it. And and it's the same thing um, with with um, with Deshaun Watson. The question is, I think that he has to learn to protect himself. Mm-hmm. I just think that I mean, it's it would be, and he's a young quarterback still, and it's going to get us into our next subject. So DeAndre Hopkins is gone, right? And one of the big, in my opinion, one of the big reasons why that has happened is they want to see Watson develop and they want to see him work the ball around the field. So now you've got Stills and Fuller and Cooks and and Cobb and then you've got David Johnson now added to the to the backfield. Um, so and along with Duke Johnson, who's also a great receiver uh, as, as a running back. So you, you start to go, OK, if this offense all of a sudden now is Deshaun a higher percentage of the time, let's say 30% of the time, hitting that back foot, throwing it out, right? So now you don't blitz and you don't do all the crazy stuff that you might ordinarily do. That now that it's not just DeAndre Hopkins getting the ball, it is six different people, uh, tight ends, it's distributed across, and oh, by the way, he can take off and run with the ball too. Um, If he develops in that way this year, then I think he can be a top two or three quarterback in the National Football League. I, it, that, to me, is the whole thing. What happens when he sits there and says, I can't lock on to a guy? And if that manufactures into, I'm going to cut my time to throw down from three seconds, which is where he's basically been for the entirety of his career, to like 2.8, 2.7, which is about league average, um, and those sacks come down, I, I'm with you. I believe that he would be top. I, I, think top I want three him is a possibility. I want him to do it in two point two for thirty percent. Yeah, and then do your scramble, do your your crazy. I mean, you don't want to take away one of the greatest playmakers in the game, but I think in order for him, for self preservation reasons alone, he has to put it in the back of the defense's mind. I might be getting this ball out in two point two seconds. And you want to blitz, go ahead. I'll take all the man coverage with those four to six guys that I can get. Yeah, as much as I will say the DeAndre Hopkins trade was just an awful decision and what they got in return was ridiculous, I don't think their offense is going to take that big of a step back. One, because, you know, Watson developing his quarterback. And two, now they have just almost interchangeable pieces, and they're all fast as hell. Like, all these guys are 4-3 type wide receivers, and it just puts a lot of stress on defenses. That's kind of the the Chiefs model Mm -hmm. of – you don't know who we're going to go to. We can go to anyone. Whereas before, you kind of knew they were going to go to Hopkins. Then it was plan B was everyone else. And, and you know who's the one guy from watching all that tape that stuck out well, to I'm me? I'm ready for this. Kenny Stills. I, I think that he can be yeah. – I think he can be that over-the-middle guy. He's much tougher than I thought. He understands zone defenses. He knows how to settle down in the hole. He's still a 4-3-something guy that can take the, the top off. But I think if I were looking for maybe a bit of a breakout candidate as far as just volume of catches, I'm not even sure he's going to start, you know, when you look at at what's going on with that team. But I do think that he will have a chance to be – to take over that role of I can get open in a multitude of different ways. So He he stole Randall Cobb's spot from you. Because it was a couple weeks ago that you were waxing poetic about. I, I think they might play all four. Yeah, I, I really do. I mean, I, I would have to consider that strongly, and then you know, we'll see how it goes. All right, hey, I want to move on. I want to move on to Dak. So now everybody in the conversation, right, Watson got paid, Mahomes got paid, and Dak's up, and he's playing on a, uh, on a, on a one-year deal this year. Um, how much pressure is on Dak Prescott to produce this season? Because it's they've got weapons everywhere. Now, Lyle Collins is not playing at, at uh, the right tackle position. That was a bit of a surprise for everybody. Frederick's not playing. Uh, so there's some holes on that offensive line. But at the skill positions, uh, this, is a, this is a good-looking team. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any more pressure than it was last year, though is the thing and he performed last year it's kind of just business as usual when you're the starting quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys at this point so I, I think he's and what he has around him at the receiver position 
and going to Mike McCarthy as his offense coordinator or as his head coach, not as offense coordinator. But I, I just think this is as good a situation as not exists in the NFL. There are some maybe some more talented like O line wide receiver combos, but this is about as good a situation he's had in his career. Okay. I, I, I knew you were going to say that there wasn't that much pressure because from a monetary standpoint, he's going to be fine, yeah. right? And I think that's what you're saying, and that's totally right. But let's think about this. There is pressure because the defense might not be very good, and they, they were a great offense last year that didn't win football games. Mm-hmm. They have to win. And so I think that there's a little bit extra pressure where it's like if they lose again, they got a new coach, um, if they don't win 10 plus games, is it because Dak Prescott just can't deliver when he's got the weapons around him? So I think there is some pressure there. I am just very curious. I'm so fascinated to watch this team because Dak Prescott hovers right in that seven, eight, nine, ten range in terms of ranking quarterbacks. If can he get himself into the top five this year? I, I'm I'm tell you, you, you talk about the defense not being that good, and I think you speak because you're a huge believer that secondary mm-hmm. wins games and uh, Byron Jones and they've got some injuries back there to deal with too. Um, but you're talking about now you've got De- DeMarcus Lawrence to begin with mm-hmm. and sign Everson Griffin, who's mm-hmm. He's a great. beast, right? And Alden Smith, by all accounts, He's has back. been lighting it up. <laughs> uh, apparently, the the battles between Alden Smith and Tyron Smith down there during practice have been legendary. Heavy hand wars of what's been going on. So if you – and then Randy Gregory, who knows, in, in a month he might be back playing on, on this team. So at least you're going to have the possibility of a high-scoring offense like the old Colts teams, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And what did they have? They had edge Speed. rushers, pass rushers that can get after the quarterback. If we're going to play a shootout, give me those edge players and let's go get your quarterback, get a sack, fumble, an interception every once in a while. So I'm really curious, is this Dallas pass rush potentially going to be as good as I think they might be? And, and will, you know, Trayvon Diggs, and I'm – you know, Mike, you obviously scouted him a mm-hmm. ton. To me, is a super pivotal player. And ha- we talk a lot about, should I, I get excited about rookies for obvious reasons, but how much should I count on them to perform in the rookie season? And there were a lot of question marks around him, certainly, but do you think that he can step in and actually, like, hold down a corner spot? I think he will. I, I, don't, I don't think he'll be, like, I don't think he'll be as good as Byron Jones, but I don't, I think he'll be better than the other options they have there. And I think he'll be probably around a league average quarter cornerback well, you'll take that and yeah exactly <laughs> i think you'll take that right away and i'm very surprised he did slip to where he did i thought it was one of the steals of the draft but it will only really get there if, like i said everson griffin 32 years old Alden smith almost yeah. 31 if they don't get something from those guys because robert quinn was pretty good last year like robert quinn they they had a fairly good pass rush even still last year so are they going to get that from griffin and smith who have had their fair share of off-field right. troubles you know we'll see here's the thing with the cowboys that i think about is last year that division was there for them. Like, it was theirs. The Eagles were a walking emergency room. The Redskins and the Giants were terrible. And it, like, you could feel the weight every time those guys talked. And it wore on them, and they they faltered. But this year's setting up kind of the same. Like, the the Eagles are getting more and more injured. Mm-hmm. A lot of question marks around them. The, the Cowboys have this opportunity. They... They have to seize it. And they have C.D. Lamb. It they was have the to biggest steal of all time. It's the easiest division, like, in the NFC by far. Yeah. Uh, there's no – every other division is going to be a, a dogfight, except for the East looks like another just – We're going to see him on pass. Sunday night a lot. Uh, we're going to see a lot. <laughs> we're going to see a lot. Can't wait to get it going. All right, a couple of moves this week. Uh, Jadevian Clowney, now with uh, with Tennessee. The New Orleans Saints <laughs> tried everything <laughs> they could. Uh, buy, trade, release, whatever it was. Three-way deals, all the different things. But Clowney now comes uh, to Tennessee, a team that was so close uh, a year ago, also couldn't hold a 10-point lead against the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, can he in some way put him over the top? He's not a sack artist, but he is a big play guy that will occasionally flash and do something incredible. They, this is uh, this is my sleeper-ish, I guess if you can call it, kind of Super Bowl team. Um, and so I try not to get too worked up about 
individual defensive players, certainly. But this was their biggest weakness on this team De by far was that outside um, pass rush. I mean, Vic Beasley, you're not expecting anything, uh, certainly when he came over, and I don't think they are anymore, obviously. But they, they have coverage on the back end. They have a quarterback, finally, who can throw the ball from a clean pocket with accuracy. And they have one of the most exciting young receivers in the NFL in A.J. Brown. And now they're in a situation where maybe they can put a little pressure on the quarterback, especially with, you know, I, this doesn't get talked about a lot either, but with Simmons being in there in the interior, Jeffrey Simmons, a guy that, Mike, you talked about a, a lot last year, um, this might be a piece that you think about a championship game, you know, when you need one or two plays, at least you have someone that you know can do that. We saw that San Francisco game. Clowney took over in that one game, and it helped them get a key win. Yeah, the thing I like about the Titans, and last year they felt like they were just solid. It's like one of the most complete rosters in the NFL, but there's nowhere where you're like, oh, they're elite in this regard. They do this very well. I think they have that chance this year because they've drafted so well in recent mm -hmm. years. I think Jeffrey Simmons, you expect him to take a big step forward in year two. That secondary with Imani Hooker and Christian Fulton now, I think is going to be improved from a year ago. They drafted well at linebacker, Jayon Brown and Rashawn Evans. And then obviously A.J. Brown, I think is going to be a stud number one type of wide receiver this year and year two after you know, putting up 1,000 yards. So I do think that they have the opportunity to make that jump purely from guys within developing. And then you add Jadeem and Clowney to the mix. And I do think they have the possibility to – you just need Ryan Tannehill, though. You know, they have the possibility yeah. to repeat, but Ryan Tannehill has played like he did last year. You know, Vrabel is, is probably the most Belichickian of the coaches that have mm -hmm. moved on. I mean, this is a guy that commands immediate respect at practice. He goes out there, and, I mean, he plays outside linebacker. I mean, he yeah. is doing hand battles and wars with these big 260-pound defensive linemen out there and winning a good fair share yeah. of them. I mean, he's a guy that just commands this old-school respect that I think still works in football. I really do. I mean, everybody can be a nice guy, a player's coach, all that kind of stuff, but you still have to stand in front of that room and command the respect. And this guy uh, – You can't fake that, though, is the thing. Like, uh, you can't be that's, – That's the thing. He's yeah. being himself. Yeah. He is absolutely he being is. himself. That's yeah. what I think works. And I will say this about Mike Rabel because – it still works. It works as long as you're aware, like you're socially aware of what your players are going through and what they're thinking about. And he is young enough to get that and still be a tough guy where his players will respect him. And I think that's why, I, that's why I'm excited about the Titans and I'm, you know, our simulations love them. Um, I think the fifth best chance to make it to the, to the Super Bowl of any team this year, which struck me as being massively yeah, high. Good. But like it is a top-heavy league, and I know we're going to talk Especially about the Colts. The yeah, I know we're going to talk about the Colts here. Um, I love the Titans' win total over. We've written about it. Their chances to win that division and chances to make it to the Super Bowl, I think, are all values. All right, let, let's go on to a couple other things that happened this week. Uh, Debo Samuel now in a miraculous comeback. Looks like he may be able to play for the 49ers or possibly play on opening day. Uh, we saw. Uh, him in the Super Bowl was just so impressive. He's a big, powerful guy. I've met him before. He's just uber confident. Uh, he's one of those alpha male kind of things, and he plays like it. He catches the ball angry. He's like a George Kittle in, in that way. Uh, so much of that 49ers offense is dependent upon wide receivers being able to block on the edge. He's fantastic at that. Um, in my mind, a move-the-needle kind of guy. Yeah, and I touched on I said one of the – about Dak Prescott that they, he might have the best set of wide receivers. There's a lot of teams now that have interesting wide receiver or just like receiving cores in general. And the 49ers is one of them. And they probably have, in terms of just guys who can make plays with the ball in their hands, the best group in the NFL. I and that say. Brandon Ayuk is him, kind of the Ayuk, same guy, yeah, exactly. right? Exactly. They have like running backs at wide receiver and yeah. then they have a running, like a jumbo running back at tight end also. Yeah. It's kind of ridiculous. How much do defensive backs hate thinking about trying to tackle these guys? Oh, yeah. they're, they're Cause they're it's beast. all on them. They, yeah. they throw the ball. One of the really interesting things about the Niners is they have one of the lowest, uh, it's them and the Saints, the lowest average depth of target. And you hear that and you go, oh, we must check down all the time. No. He doesn't. They just design routes to be short, quick throws to give put guys in space. Right, right off the run game. 
So everything is just going to look the same. Yep. You know, they, they are just they, – they're they're wonderful at disguising all that getting downhill anyway. I don't want to talk about the run game. But let me let me tell you this about the Niners. We don't either. So Debo Samuel, <laughs> Debo Samuel, you go, okay. Cardinals, it's a big game, right? But then they have the Jets, the Giants, the Eagles, the Dolphins before the Rams on Sunday night. It's not a hard schedule. So I mean this team's trying to go back to the Super Bowl. I know he wants to get back and play, but you need him in January, not uh, September. And finally, Mitch Trubisky, our yes. dear friend, uh, is uh, going to be the starting quarterback, beat out Nick Foles um, this year. And you, you wonder how much of a chance Nick Foles really had to learn an offense, to practice. Everything's so short. And I've heard several coaches now say, this is going to be the year of the veteran player. We don't think that rookies, we're not sure about free agents. We're not, you know, there just isn't time to acclimate new people so you go all right who are the teams like the Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers not a lot of big changes uh to speak of that might have the best chance and I mean really in this year if you jump out to a 3-0 4-0 kind of start who knows what happens with COVID we mm -hmm. might have a nine game season I have no idea I played in two strike shortened seasons it's <laughs> like and you better win this one because it's you know we don't have many of them left here I, man um, so I didn't even ask a question. I was talking I, about Trubisky. I was going to start talking about Trubisky, and I, I said this a little while ago. My hypothesis is that you bring in Nick Foles, and you bring in a guy when there are opportunities to bring in starting caliber quarterbacks. You bring in a guy that is a backup because you want Trubisky to end up winning the job, and I think that was proven out. Like they just kind of said, "Hey, we just need to see this guy again because so many people are invested in him," and. I, there's no what is what is the reason to believe all of a sudden it's going to click what's that reason in a, in a shortened off season when people should be making smaller jumps than even normal and we've seen him do it for three years and be one of the least accurate quarterbacks in the nfl why is it going to happen now I, it, it just makes no sense to me yeah it did seem like one the trade for nick Foles was utterly absurd looks absurd in retrospect and they yes. try to justify it by saying he worked with Bill Lazor before the OC back when he was with the Eagles in 2013 and that's when Foles was great and whatever which was already an absurd like that that experience with a guy seven years ago would help him this offseason or you know get up to speed this shortened offseason but I think the reason they didn't bring Cam Newton is because mentally Mitchell Trubisky is like a, a midget. mental midget and like Cam Newton would have just owned him in the quarterback room if they did and Nick Foles similarly not a commanding personality the way like he's not going to take over and win that job right off the bat it's kind of been his mo over the course of his career also so they almost seem like they did it to try to pump up Trubisky and be like hey you can beat this guy out and then give him some confidence because they're still trying to justify that pick yeah or absolutely. else I mean Pace is losing part. his job like can, Pace is losing you, his job if they can't can you imagine going we can't bring in a guy that's an alpha male to our quarterback room because the guy we want to start is such a beta that he will just you know wilt like that when you're having that thought you should go okay maybe I should move on here's a couple of data points on Mitch Trubisky that I think say it all 32 starting quarterbacks that qualify for this uh, ranking grade from a clean pocket 32nd grade under pressure 31st been the worst quarterback in the NFL and, and okay it comes back to though the interesting dichotomy of that people don't always act what's in their best interest of the team. They act right. what's in their best interest of keeping the job. All right, let's move from that end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum here. We talk about Tampa Bay. And yes. to see Tom Brady, is was Tom Brady fading last year or were the guys around him fading last year? Uh, and I think that we're going to find out. But I, there's a chance, at least a chance in my mind, Tampa could be scary good. I mean, they've got all kinds of weapons. They have three different tight ends that can play. They've got two of the best receivers in football, a defense that's definitely young and up and coming and depends on what happens in that secondary. Could they? Could those young guys really develop? Linebackers rock solid. I, I, is Tampa the answer to all the questions this year uh, as we go forward? And compare and contrast for your final exam – to the New England Patriots with Cam Newton? They're, they're, it should work. Like, this should on paper work <laughs> offensively. 
there's too much. It's almost like too big to fail. Like there's, there's they're stacked at receiver, tight end. It's more just is Tom Brady. Is it going to go on him? You know, because it goes. We saw you know with Brett Favre with other quarterbacks in the past, if just physically Peyton Manning, like there was no reason he shouldn't have been playing well all of a sudden, but except for like a minor injury, ended up just torpedoing his ability to play quarterback. And I think that's what you worry about. You'd almost rather have like a Jimmy Garoppolo with this team because of how stacked they are than the kind of high risk, high reward of Tom Brady with just one hit could just be it for him at this point. That, I was trying to think of ways that it doesn't go well. And that was one of them. The second one I would say is just getting off to a slow start. Like if you're not on the same page as an offense and you get off to a little bit of a slow start, will they have to really battle? Because the Saints are so good. Yeah. So winning that division, even though they should have a you know really good chance to do so, is gonna be tough because the Saints are gonna be so strong. So are they battling? They have to get a wild card. Maybe we're a year early. Brady sticks around, stays healthy. And then next year they make it to the Super Bowl. And it's also tough because everyone and their mother loves this team. Yeah, everyone's betting they're over. Everyone's picking it's, them to go to the Super Bowl. It's the Eagles, twenty eleven or whatever. And I think oh, people, the dream, <laughs> the dream team. Yeah, and I think people are sleeping on their defense, which has a couple of really, really good. good young corners and linebackers that can cover. So, I mean, Chris, are you are you buying into it too? I I think the game of football in today's world is what can your quarterback orchestrate at the line of scrimmage? Hmm. I mean, we used to think that the play callers on the sideline, we show them 400 times during the course of a game. But in reality, in the NFL today, it comes down to Tom Brady is going to see the defense. The play caller never anticipated what they're about to run. He's going to do a quick check. He's going to wink at, at Gronk, or he's going to do something with Mike Evans. They're going to hit a big play. It's the same reason that, that – you know, what, what is the old thing? The elevators are going different directions. <laughs> you know, Howie Long used to say that when you're young, your, your physical skills are up here and your, your mental, mental skills stuff. are down here, and then it sort of goes like that. Um, but, but Drew Brees and Tom Brady slugging it out in that division is going to be phenomenal because those two guys get the last look at your defense. And within two seconds, they have the ability to get into the right play. So even if their physical skills aren't quite what they are, the play calling is going to be so much better than what it could ever be with a, with a coach calling in plays to a young quarterback. And I would say this about Tom Brady. Last year, his supporting cast was as bad as there was in the NFL. They were awful. Edelman was hurt. Keel Harry couldn't separate from his table. Sanu's gone. Sanu's gone, and they had no tight ends. The year before, and the year before that, and the year before that, and the year before that, he has a top five quarterback. Yeah. With Brandon Cooks, they attacked the intermediate and deep uh, portions of the field, and he was awesome. Highest graded quarterback throwing between 10 and 19 yards downfield. So I see no reason, unless he's susceptible to one injury, like you said, Mike, why it wouldn't be awesome. I also say they're dangerously thin on their offensive line. Anyone gets hurt, and but at it's least bad. At least they drafted one. I mean, you look. Yeah. At, uh, there are a lot of other yeah, teams that are dangerously to. thin on but, the offensive but line. Didn't, they, didn't but how good were the Patriots on the offensive line? You they know, they I, were. They're solid still. I mean, they, they, but not, they're, but they're, he doesn't. He doesn't need. He yeah. doesn't need it. You know, that's the thing. Protect thyself is is sort of the thing. You know what? You know what protects them? Receivers that are open. That, that wow. always works. Uh, Drew Brees. Now, who knows how many years Drew Brees has left uh, in this league? Uh, th there's so many teams that feel like they're loading up for this one last run, right? Let's, let's put everything we have, even Leonard Fournette's going to Tampa now. So Needle uh, mover. Yeah. So, so Drew Brees now, is there enough left? Because this is a team that has been so close now for so long. It's almost – the odds almost feel like it finally has to swing a little luck back in their favor. I am so torn on the Saints. And we had uh, the ringers, Kevin Clark, on the forecast, and he was equally torn. I just don't know because you're excited about the additions to this team. I think Emmanuel Sanders, what he did for that Niners offense, you called how many Niners games last A year? A bunch. You've seen the splits between pre-Sanders, post-Sanders. Yeah. He's really good. Best second receiver they've had there. Alvin Kamara just being back, right? Oh, yeah, being healthy is an awesome asset. And then you look at Drew Brees and you say, man, he really has struggled down the stretch. Yes. Like 
each of the past two years noticeably. And he has struggled to push the ball down the field. We haven't seen that with Tom Brady. So I'm going to flip it back on you. You have to pick one of these 40-plus-year-old quarterbacks, Chris, to take you to the Super Bowl, Tom Brady or Drew Brees. Who would you take? I think Tom Brady has more around him. You know, and, and, and my Tom Brady's done enough in my lifetime to where I'm not ready to – to give up, I think I saw the receivers a year ago. They weren't open. They weren't making plays for him. Um, and I, I just keep picturing in the back of my mind Tom Brady holding that trophy up one more time. And he's such a nut, competitive nut. And and Belichick or Brady would never say this out loud, but you know the greatest competition in the NFL this year is between those two. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's between those two just from the standpoint that. They both have heard it their entire careers. Which one is it? Is it Brady? Is it Belichick? What you know? What are we talking about here? Um, and I, I, I just think that they, they have a chance. I mean, I love Kamara so much. I, I think Kamara possibly is the best back in the league when you combine everything oh, that you. sucker can do. Um, and his being back is going to be a huge deal. But I, I'd have to say right now, I'm a, I'm a little worried about the the. Do they have the receiver coming out of the backfield that Brady loves? That, that one bothers me a little bit. Uh, but, yeah, I'm going to say Tom. I'd say Tom Brady, too. He just breathes his arm. It's, it's late, late, late years of Peyton Manning where you have yep. to be perfect. And then you just really cannot attack down the field on certain route concepts. And teams know it. And I think that's why in the playoffs you go up against, you know, like a Mike Zimmer coach defense and he gets exposed, even though it's not – just because you, you can sit on that underneath stuff at some point, and he's going to have to go down the field. He only had 11 big time throws. Hey, all they last need season. that. Just James. does not does not so have just it. throw Jameis in there, man, I, and throw it deep yeah, and, beat, and put you, Taysom in to run it. I am with you guys 100 percent in a vacuum. I just to me, Tom Brady physically, I'm taking him yes. 10 times out of 10 versus Drew Brees, and I think this off season has been easier for Tom Brady in a lot of ways than it has been for Drew Brees. I think that culture in Tampa Bay is going to be awesome. Here's my prediction. Next year, there will be a real conversation about Jameis Winston and the New Orleans Saints. I think he could be awesome. He had two for 5,000 yards last year. I think he could be awesome with Sean Payton. And that... uh, I'm with you. He needed to change the scenery. And and with Taysom is that change-up kind of guy. Yeah. That, That dude runs over people can't tell you. I, I bet you I saw four times where he hit some tough DB, some safeties coming up, and crushed them, crumpled them. Can, it, can you tell us what – because you've done a bunch of Saints games. Can you tell us, like, the hype that the Saints have around Taysom Hill, like from a Sean Payton perspective? Oh, my God. It, it, he, he was so ridiculous. He, he can't – so he never wants to tell us anything, mm-hmm. Sean, right? He's, he's uh, Bill Parcells. So the greatest guy in the world, he'll come, hey, how you guys doing, da, 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 you know, and he's got some story, and he started launching in on Taysom Hill, and this was before anybody ever heard of the guy. Oh, I just think this guy's going to be this, and that, and he's going to be able to da, 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 da. And like 25 minutes later, I was like, is it all right if I ask you just one friggin' question that pertains to this game instead of your third-string quarterback back there? And so, and he's kind of won. He said, all right, one. So I asked whatever it was. But it ends up he was serious. I mean, this guy can legit play. And then supposedly he's like a scratch golfer. It's like there's nothing this guy can't do. It's like he's just one of those freakazoid kind of guys. And All right. They found uh, 10 million. <laughs> yeah. They better be. You, Phillip, I, I, I want to move on to the next one. Philip Rivers. Is it possible collectively – we are all sleeping on the Indianapolis Colts. We're talking about all these other guys, and here they are. Phillip Rivers is not going to know what to do if he, if he can hold the ball longer than 2.1 seconds. He's never had it in his whole career. I'm all in on him. Yeah, I'm all in I'm on I'm going to give you the here. floor since you're all I, in. I just think this is the best offensive line in the NFL, I think, quite easily. Uh, they just have all the pieces there to dominate up front. And it's like you said, it's going to be the least any team has leaned on Phillip Rivers in his entire since, you know, since the year he tore his ACL in the playoffs. And they were, I think, the one seed that year. This is the most talent he's had around him. And he's going to go from a situation where basically every game was on his arm 
and he had to get the ball out immediately with a terrible offensive line for the Chargers. Is this going to be John Elway now, you know, late in his late. career? It's what, hmm. yeah. Rely on the run like, game? Wow, that's a good Are we going to see any of that? I, I think that's what – that's a very apt comparison. I, I think that's what you'll see is just when you can't quantify that peace of mind, and I think that's going to be so huge for Phillip Rivers. And he's only, he's only 38. Like, he's not – at the point where these other guys are. Yes, he had a bad year last year, but like the situation was also bad. I think about this with Phil Rivers. He, in some ways, plays the game very mathematically. We saw him make these awful throws last year. But he's sitting there and he goes, look, I, I have no shot at winning this game unless I give it a shot. Yeah. I'm not going to go down taking sacks. I'm going to put the ball up and take some shots. And to me, that's what I saw with Phil Rivers in a bunch of the games we watched last year. Well, it's like the last five years. Yeah, <laughs> true. Down in a by lot six of games. And at six p.m. No, no, uh, no. Quarterback has taken more hits because of his offensive tackles than Philip Rivers has. And this year, not only does he have two good offensive tackles, he has good interior as well. Here's my one question to you guys: Those receivers in Los Angeles, Keenan Allen specifically, mm -hmm. there isn't a receiver on this Colts team that Michael is Michael Pittman out. better be. So is that uh, – He better be. What's the, that's the – That's the big guy, right? Yeah. I mean, he's the contested catch guy, and that's mm -hmm. what Phillip Rivers has always been about. Yeah, I think they have enough. Like, it's not going to be as good, but I, I think with T.Y. Hilton and Michael Pittman, that's – you can win with that at least. So are you guys Colts over Titans? <sighs> I am. I think – and I think their defense – it's another <laughs> team that's just so young defensively. Slash Texans. Forrest Buckner. <laughs> I mean, it's hard, right? How I mean, fun is this division? It's a, it's a fun division, and it's one that hasn't gotten a lot of attention historically. I, I think that they're going to get a lot of attention this year. Speaking of not a lot of attention, let me talk <laughs> about the beloved Cincinnati Bengals yes. and Joe Burrow. Um, Mike, I've heard you wax poetic about how this guy is off the charts yeah. as far as what we've been – what is it now, our year six, five? Six years of college grading. Six years of college grading now, and he is the guy. Yeah, and the interesting thing is kind of everyone who comes into contact with them, the guys who he was training with pre-draft, uh, the you know, beat reporters this fall that have seen him, everyone just can't believe like how accurate this guy is with the football, how good he is, how composed he is uh, in pretty much everything he does. And I think that's just the recipe for a guy hitting the ground year one. Like he was in an NFL offense last mm -hmm. year. He was admittedly said he tre treated it as if he was a pro player. He wasn't going out yeah. to, you know, he wasn't even going to class. He had all online classes. Like he was acting as if he was a professional already. There's nothing new about that in college <laughs> yeah. football. But, but <laughs> and he's playing, you know, some of the elite defenses in college football and never had a bad game. I, I just think there's too much going for him that, I, I think here's my question for you and and so when I was watching him and, and a lot of times I wasn't even watching him I was watching somebody else on LSU's offense but the one thing that kept coming up in my mind like their center what was the name of their center Lloyd Kushner. Kushner. yeah so he was a good run blocker right yeah. and he but he he if you put a quick nose on him they were yeah. getting around him he might completely not even touch him and so many times that that Joe Burrow had a guy running right at his nose and somehow backpedaled or sidestepped and, and was able to make the throw and get the ball out, run, do whatever. I, I just think when you're playing in Cincinnati, and you know I know Jonah Williams is coming back for yeah. the Bengals here, but this is a, a shaky at best offensive line, that's gonna be a real skill set for him. Um, but it's, man, this is a tough division. You're talking about some really good players and good teams in this division is it just way too much too soon to expect anything well I think in terms of the Bengals overall yeah I think it's too soon they just don't have it defensively I don't think at this point they just don't have enough but I do I do think he could have the best rookie season we've seen since you know like a Russell Wilson yeah like 12. people are excited around I, here I don't think that's hyperbolic at all yeah and the what the skill set you just described reminds me of one person in the NFL currently Mahomes. Mahomes. <laughs> no question. That's the guy who we talked about it with comparing him to Watson. Mahomes takes an inordinate amount of hits, does not take sacks. He does not. He's top five in the NFL in each of the past two seasons in sack rate. He doesn't take them. He gets rid of the ball. Here's the thing for me when I think about what allows Mahomes to do that. He's got receivers that are going to get open. He's got trust in Travis Kelsey. He's got Tyreek Hill sprinting past guys. And 
do the Bengals give Burrow the options like he had at LSU to be able to make some of those plays? Because I think if they're open, that guy's going to find them. Dude is insanely accurate. I do think the receiving core is good. And I think John yeah. Ross was very good last year when he was healthy, healthy being a big I mean, with him. I, but, and he worked out with him this spring, John Ross. So. Burrow, Tyler Boyd. Yeah. And Boyd's absolutely AJ, AJ, if he can stay healthy. All right, let's – I want to move on to the – stay within the division here. Um, big Ben coming back. So they're playing – Pittsburgh's playing with quarterbacks that were off bad. the street, right? Really bad. They were they were ducked and duckless. And <laughs> it by, was – By the way, <laughs> you guys at Sunday night having to do a Steelers game with Duck Hodges and putting in countless hours of research for Duck Hodges to go out and just – you Blail should have heard around. Al. You know, he's studying how to do a duck call. <laughs> you know, no, he wasn't. Um, so, so Pittsburgh, because of the way they played last year offensively, their defense knew they had to win the game, right? And they almost did. That, yeah. that defense was unbelievable mm -hmm. a, a season ago. So now you, you go, okay, I've seen guys that have Tommy John surgery in baseball mm – -hmm. And a lot of guys go, I can't wait to have Tommy John surgery because you come out better than what you went into mm -hmm. the thing with. So, and all reports are that he's throwing the ball great. And you do. so you, you put Big Ben back in with this greatly improved defense, Minka Fitzpatrick, you know, all these guys. Um, is, is this the team that, that is going to come out of nowhere and win the AFC? I have two big questions. We talked about Tom Brady and how, okay, last year was bad, but the year before that, he was awesome. With Big Ben, we saw a little bit of a fall off in 2018 when he still had a bunch of weapons, the whole Antonio Brown thing. They cl clearly weren't on the same page, but he was 16th in the NFL in, in grade, um, 78. So does he still have like the upper echelon ability? Can he be a top 10 guy? And, the and no Antonio Brown. And no Antonio yeah. Brown. And that's really my second question, which is, does this wide receiving core, I know we love Deontay Johnson, I love Deontay Johnson, but are they good enough to take a 12th graded, 13th graded quarterback to the playoffs? So my thing is, uh, I've, everyone just assumes Roethlisberger's back, offense is back, defense is going to be elite again. They're you know maybe right up there with the Ravens and the AFC North. Roethlisberger was not good last year before he got hurt. He sucked against the Patriots, and he was bad in that Seahawks game before he got hurt. I think losing Antonio Brown is a massive with what he brought to the table. Like Roethlisberger had yeah. so many completions to Antonio Brown that no one on that roster right now is going to or are gonna is gonna Chase happen. Just, I, no, there's no, there's not <laughs> anyone who can just do what Antonio Brown did Notre in terms Dame of some five. of those downfield throws that he made. And talk yeah. about you know Brady's 43, Breeze is 42. Those guys take care of themselves. Ben Roethlisberger. It's pretty obvious he's not taking care of himself in the best way. All right, here, here we I'm go. Just All right, let's let's wrap Make the this case. thing up. Do you, what do you think about the Steelers? I'm about to tell you. Oh, okay. I'm All about right. to tell you with with some of our picks. There you go. Here we go. All right, we're gonna we're gonna start things off. We're gonna wrap up this show here. We're gonna start with with rookie of the year, and I, uh, Mike's already sold me. I've got to go, Joe Burrow. I, I just I saw too much out of him. Chase maybe in, in Washington. But, I mean, anybody else really top of mind for you? You're the one studying So, offensive guys. rookie of the year, to me, it's either Joe Burrow or one of those running backs. Mm -hmm. Probably Clyde edwards Hilaire is in the best position to just rack up rushing yards, touches. Every running back in the you know, under Andy Reid racks up yards and touches. That's just how he's schemed to the position over the course of the year. But I do think Joe Burrow, they lean quarterback even at that award if they put up any Clyde sort of stats. Edwards so, I do think mm -hmm. Joe Burrow is the guy who's going to win it. Fantasy darling. Uh, here's my – I'm with you on Burrow. Here's my dark horse because um, I agree with you on the running backs. What about Brandon Ayuk? If he has to step in and be a real part of that passing offense, um, 11 yards after the catch perception last year. And they don't really have much up. They don't have much And else. he yeah. looks like Debo. I mean, when yeah. they drafted him, I was like, well, that doesn't surprise yeah. anybody, right? He's the same kind of guy. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this backwards. Okay. I'm going to go MVP, and I'm going to assume I'm going – Mahomes, but you guys can go anywhere you want. I'm going to go with Drew Brees as almost like a lifetime achievement MVP. Wow. Because he's never won one. He's never won an MVP. Wow. Like, uh, the, I think the good. recent history suggests it's probably going to be Kyler Murray, right, with how you know, second-year quarterbacks have won <laughs> well, it every the, year. The betting but market believes you as well. 
uh, which I, I he's just don't 12 to it. one. That's absurd to me. But I do think Drew Brees, if he's statistically up there, I think it almost like they give him a lifetime achievement MVP. Okay. Um, I've got, uh, I'm with you on Mahomes, obviously a huge favorite and should be. Russell Wilson should have been the MVP last year. Obviously, it took a historic season from Lamar Jackson, but from a passing standpoint, there was no one better. Tyler Lockett being hurt really hurt them down the stretch. He's healthy. He'll put up ridiculous numbers. And then I have two long shots for you. Jimmy G is 40 to 1. You knew that San Francisco you, bias. Yeah. You knew you that out. was coming it out. It took an hour, but we got I you. knew that was coming out. Jimmy G. And, uh, and Matt Ryan, they have a shot to win that division. No one wants to talk about it. They have a shot because they have the best quarterback the wide Falcons. receiver do. I can't give up on the Falcons. <laughs> He's 33 to 1 if they overcome that. Have you seen their secondary, Bill? <laughs> I've tried not to look at the secondary. All right, I've got a, I've got a Chiefs production meeting coming up here in about uh, 20 minutes. We're I trying gotta, to stall, so I'm we gonna, get in. I know you want to get me embarrassed. <laughs> I want to make sure I got to ask Andy about getting free cheeseburgers. So, um, so uh, we did that. Offense, defensive player of the year. This one's easier. I, obviously, Aaron Donald's to me the one that's just he's so much better than anybody else in the NFL on defense. But fire away. I think Miles Garrett. Ooh. could win the defensive player of the year. He was kind of on trajectory before he you know, slammed his helmet off of Mason Rudolph's dome. But you look at how much he's progressed every single year of his career. Like he, was, mm. he didn't know how to rush the passer when he came into the NFL. He did not really have moves. He's just an absolute – like he's on Aaron Donald's level in terms of freaks of nature athletically. And I think he's only starting to figure it out more and more every year. I think if he would have had a full season last year, would have put up something like 15 sacks. I think if he does that, he's in the conversation. The bizarre thing about him is he's the sweetest, yeah. artistic – a soft-spoken guy and no killer instinct look seemingly off the field, uh, and then, then he, he hit the until he gets a helmet, helmet yeah. in his hands. Um, so. I'm gonna go uh, because I have to with my coverage bias Jalen Ramsey who I think is being slept on because he's had this you know he's in Jacksonville Jacksonville's dumpster fire he comes over to the Rams the Rams are not very good um, but to me if I'm taking cornerbacks right now he's my number one pick and I think now with that year of stability, he's going to ball out. Needs a new contract, too. Which, which uh, yeah, I think he'll be motivated. motivated motivational. Be definitely motivated. All right. Offensive player of the year. You, have to, you cannot do Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> Offensive player of the year. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go flyer here. Okay. I'm going Dak Prescott. Ooh. I think there are so many weapons on that football team, and you throw Pollard into that mix as well, um, that – this and they were good last year second year in the, in the same offense add a little flavor from Holmgren hmm. I, I just think he has Perfect. all the motivating factors to have a huge year uh what I say he's a Holmgren, Holmgren. <laughs> yeah it's great though. uh Green Bay they're yeah. just different names pop in your head um so there you go I, I I like it and offensive rookie of the year voting look this up before is just a shit show it's the last time a quarterback won it who wasn't the MVP was 11 when Breeze won it and Aaron Rodgers is the MVP. There's been three times since then, all were the quarterbacks that were MVP. Sometimes it's wide receiver, sometimes it's running back. I'm going to go wide receiver here, though. I'm going to go Devontae Adams. Oh, you stole mine. Stole, steal yours. <laughs> because he won, like, when he was healthy last year, was averaging, like, over 100 yards yeah, a game, got insane. hurt, uh, came back, uh, was a little limited, and then down the stretch dominated through the playoffs. They have no one else to go to, so Rodgers is going to be looking for him. And Rodgers throws touchdowns to wide receivers in the red zone, and he, like they have had like three different wide receivers over the course of his career there lead the league in touchdowns. I think this year Devonte Adams does it, and I think he has a big one. Well, I agree with you, Mike. And uh, since I have to be different, what about Aaron Rodgers? Ooh. I am all in on the Aaron Rodgers redemption. It is scorcher. Aaron Rodgers all in on a San Francisco 49er Washington Redskin style of offense he has to be he's either in or he's out and it you just wonder did that have anything to do with why they drafted a quarterback in the first round yeah my question with Rodgers is whether he is so vindictive that he's gonna go I'm actually not gonna play well for you guys and I'll go well he did that with Marcy, else. for sure <laughs> it seemed like but if he goes you know what actually I'm gonna show you that you're going to want to keep Jordan Love on the bench and, you know, wants to stay in Green Bay and go scorched earth. I think he's still got the upper echelon ability. And uh, I love, Adams awesome. I love the uh, kind of narrative coming out of Green Bay because he answered a question saying he watched some 2010 tape of himself yes. and that he realized something 
and now he has been playing different. Won't tell you what it was, but he a realized Aaron something. Nagler? I, I'll bet I All can. In, <laughs> I, I, in 2010, a higher percentage of his throws got out quickly. <laughs> yeah. He oh, yeah. He's doing a little bit of the Watson thing now. You know, he's, he's always yeah. stepping up. He's good at it, yeah. and he should do it, but I think he could help himself as well with a higher percentage of quick throws. Well, that's, the, that's what the Niners do. So if that's a part of their offense. I, it might work, right? I, it, it, it and might he stopped fit. attacking the middle of the field whatsoever. No. All right. Did, uh, final thing. Super Bowl picks. Oh, God. Are we going to do coach of the year? San Francisco and who? Oh, you can do coach <laughs> of the year. Go ahead. I haven't even thought about coach I've of got year. one for you here. Belichick? Okay, Belichick and, um, uh, Belichick and Bruce Arians are the co-favorites. Mike McCarthy is the third favorite. I'm going down the list, though. 22 to 1. I already talked about my team here, Mike Vrabel. Mm. I, it wouldn't Coach surprise me. It would not. Although it's not, it wouldn't be as stunning this year as it was last year yeah. if they had done it right. I'm going to go, I like Mike McCarthy just because <laughs> they always seemingly give it to a guy who makes a f- first year head coaches win at a disproportionately high level. Uh, they underperformed last year record wise. Yep. They are a much better team, I think, feel like on paper this year than they were last year. So they're just a seemingly regression candidate to get better this season. And obviously that offense should just be better with you know, a better yeah. second year. And when, and when they crumble, OC. Ron Rivera will get coach of the year for winning the NFC. I'm going Mike Tomlin. I'm going the Pittsburgh Steelers in the Super Bowl, playing the 49ers. Wow. Oh. 49ers come back and win it. And there you go. But I think Tomlin's coach of the year. Give me your Super Bowl picks. And let's get the heck out of Dodge. All right. Uh, I'm going to sort of reverse jinx myself, uh, and I'm going to go with Chiefs, Seahawks. Oh, I could spend an hour on you picking the Seahawks. That's unbelievable. <laughs> Are you really? Yeah. <laughs> and who takes it? Who's uh, the Chiefs win? Okay. I'm not going to do that to myself. But I think Russ. I think they let Russ cook a little bit. Hmm. That defense. People talk about Adams. Dunbar is good. They can. They can cover. They have great wide receivers, and Russell Wilson's awesome. So you're picking the running team, Seattle Seahawks, and your favorite team is the running team, San Francisco 49ers. Yes. We have some talk. We have some do. issues. Yes. I'm going to go Saints versus Colts, and I think the Saints won last hurrah. They're just – You just bagged on Breeze, though. I know, but they're just – that <laughs> roster is out of this world. Like in terms of how much talent they have at every single position. All right, that's it. Steve, Sam, get your butts back in here. Go to work. And uh, it's been fun, though. Thanks for coming in, guys. And uh, we shall see you after opening day. How about that? God, I'm excited. Thanks for watching the PFF YouTube channel. And if you want to subscribe, all you have to do is push the button. Don't forget everything you get. A little fantasy, push the button. A little green line for the gambling aspects of the game, push the button. College football, push the button. The YouTube channel from PFF.